next speaker is my partner from Schiff Harden in San Francisco, Steve Hankins. Steve leads our firm's intellectual property group nationwide. He's managed and tried patent infringement cases, including Hatch-Waxman claims and related antitrust claims. He has experience in federal and state trial and appellate courts in matters ranging from emergency injunctive relief to extended complex jury trials. Steve's here today to give in-house counsel a practical guide, always a good thing to have, to strategies for managing patent infringement claims and litigation. If you would, please join me in welcoming Steve Hankins. Thank you. That was uncharacteristically brief for Jeff. I was expecting more. All right, good morning. I'm grateful for the uh, St. Jude presentation. I was a little worried about uh, fear from the audience over any kind of technical nature for this uh, discussion, and I'll guarantee you there is none, especially after that. Let's start with uh, testing your acumen on a couple of uh, issues. These are what I'm going to address here today. Um, generally, very generally, what is a patent? and how do you respond if someone provides you with a patent and says you're infringing it? Last, how to budget for any kind of litigation that you might have over patents. This is the acumen question. The first question that you'll get from your CEO if you have a patent dispute, I guarantee you, is this question. So let's, I have two examples here, and let's test your ability to spot out the patent. One of these options is a patent, the other two are not. Option one, a stretcher-sized turntable to help the baby out by cent uh, centrifugal force. Can't even pronounce it. Option two, an artificial rubber uterus in which to place a newborn so that the action of childbirth is not so violent. Number three, a soundproof helmet for the mother so the poor child doesn't have to hear screams. All right, raise of hands. Is the patent number one? One, two, three. People with patent litigation experience, maybe. Number two? Number three. Number two wins in the audience, but number one is the patent. There is actually a patent for this device that spins the mother around to help the baby out by centrifugal force. Let's try again. Software, key issue in patent cases. One of these is a patent, two or not. Test you again. Option one is a program that automatically pixelates the triple X portions of pornographic pictures so that religious people can safely look at them. Option number two, a program that senses when your cat is walking on your keyboard and turns your computer off, disables the keyboard. Option number three, a software program for shy people in chat rooms that automatically generates provocative messages that they can't generate on their own. All right, audience says, how many are in favor of number one, the pixelating of triple X pictures? How many for number two? How many for number three? All right, you're almost ready to graduate from Patent Law 101. In fact, there is a company in Arizona, the land of Snell and Wilmer, called PawSense. PawSense has been uh, very publicly talking about its popular software program and its plans to patent that program. Unfortunately, in the five minutes that it took for me to prepare this slide, I found prior art that I will send to PawSense, which is a patent on the left, already exists for disabling a computer when a cat walks on the keyboard. So yes, you can get a patent on that, but not PawSense. What is a patent? That would take probably days of the seminar to explain to you. I'll tell you, if you've never read a patent, the first time that you go to read one, skip everything at the beginning, and go right to the end, the section called the claims. The claims set out the scope of the monopoly that the government has given the patentee for 20 years on an idea. You'll have to go through diagrams and about 20 pages of description before that, which is important, 
But if you want to find out what you're dealing with in terms of the scope of the patent, it's going to be in the claims. I've put up here claim one of a patent 596, and this is commonly known as the peanut butter and jelly patent, held by Smuckers. When the patent was first issued, it did not call for peanut butter and jelly. It called for two pieces of bread with a filling in between, no crust, and crimped on the edges. I don't know if any of you have children, but the patent was embodied in a product called Crustables, Uncrustables. Smuckers was very uh, excited about this patent and their Uncrustable product, and they set forth uh, enforcing that patent in Michigan. I don't know how many of you have been on I-75 in Michigan and seen signs for pasties. Pasties are basically a sandwich without a crust, crimped on the edges, um, and utilizing a technology that's been in place since Cornwall. Smuckers tried to enforce this patent against pasties, uh, a pasties manufacturer named Albies, and Albies took them to town, went to the patent office, and invalidated the patent. Cannot get a patent on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. When you want to find out what the scope of the patent is, you got to go to the claims. What do you do when you get a license offer from someone? And let's look at an example. If you're not an experienced patent lawyer, this will look like a very nice letter that you might not need to respond to. It's phrased usually with the wording, you may wish to have patent counsel examine whether a non-exclusive license is required for this patent. Sitting on this letter is the worst thing you could possibly do. It starts what they call a notice period for you, where you have notice of the patent and various damages start to be triggered from your receipt of this notice. It's written in this very nice way to avoid a declaratory relief action. Prior uh, to some case law, uh, there was a letter written that said, uh, we wanted to notify you that you're infringing our patent. Patentees stopped sending that when they got sued in jurisdictions that they didn't like and started writing these nicer letters. Unfortunately, these nicer letters can also serve as a basis for declaratory relief if you decide you want to respond that way. Don't ignore this letter. I put up front some best practices for responding to a letter like this. And I'll go through in the rest of the presentation the reasons why these are best practices. The first thing you need to do is gather together your client. Look at the product lines that are accused in the letter. Determine how critical they are to the business, what the revenue stream is from them. Talk to the engineers uh, for that product line about the possibilities of designing around the patent and any kind of non-infringement defenses that you might have. They are your best source for looking at the patent and the product. They're invested, so you'll have to uh, neutralize them a little bit. But they're free, and they're available to you, and you're going to need them for the rest of any kind of litigation that might ensue. Counsel advice is the second thing that you ought to do when you get a letter like that. Ask your counsel, does that letter provide me with proper notice? Has the trigger for the clock started to run on my notice period for damages? Does it contain sufficient information, not all of them do, on what I'm doing, what the scope of the patent is, for the trigger on damages to begin? A number of you will have indemnity rights. Uh, in particular, uh, there are a couple of trolls out there right now sending letters for software and uh, Wi-Fi devices. Um, there are vendors that supply you with either software or devices. You should check your supply agreements for any kind of indemnity rights you might have. Even though that letter was so nice, you should think about your litigation strategy. This is your chance to pick your jurisdiction rather than having the jurisdiction pit, uh, picked for you. Look at the forum uh, where you sit. Is it more favorable than the forum where the plaintiff might sue you? And is there a reason to go for declaratory relief? This is a big move, and it should be done carefully. But uh, oftentimes, uh, even if it's a non-practicing entity, it's worthwhile to file an action to see if it can't get resolved more favorably. 
Why do you have to go through this process? Because the exposure can be gigantic. In August alone, there were $2 billion verdicts in patent cases. The first one was in St. Louis involving DuPont and Monsanto and their ground up product for uh, weeds and corn crops. And the second, of course, was the Apple Samsung patent in San Jose, California, our backyard. After you're asked, can you really get a patent on that, you should be asked, what's my exposure? And I'm just going to go through very quickly here the general categories of uh, damages and other relief that can be sought in a patent infringement case. There's an injunction. The law on that has changed recently to bring it more in line with the law that all of you are more familiar with, requiring irreparable harm. There's a high likelihood that irreparable harm is going to be found if it's a competitive situation, two companies that are actually producing a product uh, that's covered by the patent, and where the competitive field is not crowded. Reasonable royalty is the most common form of damages in patent cases. And this is based on this bizarre uh, legal construct called the hypothetical negotiation. What happens in patent cases is two experts get up and they opine on what the parties would have done at the very beginning of time if the patent had been presented and a, hypothet and a, neg and a negotiation over a royalty occurred. It is the most ludicrous form of expert testimony you will ever encounter. And there are 15 steps to the process under a case called Georgia Pacific. It's a complete fiction. Lost profits are frequently sought in patent cases. And here there's a, a but-for standard. The patentee has to prove that uh, but for your product, they would have gotten the sale. So again, the competitive landscape is very important for you to analyze. If it's a two-company industry, there's a higher likelihood of lost profits than if there's a 15 competitor industry. The exposure doesn't end there. Again, through the well-publicized Apple Samsung case, uh, there, there is a possibility of getting treble damages for willful infringement, and there's a possibility of attorney's fees if the case is found to be exceptional. Underline the words willful infringement and exceptional because they don't mean what, they, what you think they mean. Willful infringement is basically a reasonableness standard. It's not a punitive damages standard. You don't have to intend ill will for anybody to get hit with a willfulness infringement verdict. You have to act objectively reasonable in light of the patent that's been asserted against you, and you have to have the subjective belief that you don't infringe to survive a willfulness claim. Exceptional. Exceptional findings have been found where defenses have changed during the course of litigation and people have had to chase down defense theories that are no longer asserted at trial. That's an exceptional case. It doesn't mean what uh, it might mean in a normal litigation. Question three. What happens when you get sued for patent infringement? The jurisdiction is decided for you. The most important factor in when you're looking at the invitation to license a patent is where am I going to get sued if the plaintiff sues me? And the Eastern District of Texas is one of the most popular places for you to be sued. It is very hard to move out of the Eastern District of Texas, although it's easier now than it used to be. This is a famous case involving Abbott. Nobody was from the Eastern District of Texas. You had Centicor in Pennsylvania, you had NYU in New York, and you had Abbott in Illinois. Case tried to a jury in Eastern District of Texas. Do you want to decide the forum, or do you want to decide it for you? This slide turned out to be hard to read in your materials. It's on pages uh, 85 to 88. And I just want to go through some of these jurisdictions where some of these awards were made. This is from a PricewaterhouseCooper 2011 survey for 15 years from 1995 to 2010. The case that we were just talking about was a Centicor case, and that was in the billions in the Eastern District of Texas. That award was overturned. 
The next case is a case involving Lucent and Microsoft here in beautiful San Diego, California. The initial award was $1.5 billion. It was later reduced, you'll see, down in the screen in 2008 to a mere $368 million. $512 million after prejudgment interest was assessed. Mirror Worlds versus Apple, Eastern District of Texas. That came in at $600 million in damages. Overturned on appeal, but how would you like to deliver that damages award to your CEO? Eolus versus Microsoft, that one was in Chicago. $500 million, overturned and then settled. Safran is a famous uh, plaintiff in some of these patent cases. He sued Boston Scientific where? Eastern District of Texas. $432 million verdict settled afterwards. Unilock versus Microsoft was in Rhode Island. That was reversed and then settled. Lucent versus Microsoft was the second phase of the San Diego case. Rambus versus Hynix Semiconductor, Northern District of California. I4I Partnership versus Microsoft, Eastern District of Texas. Medtronic versus Boston Scientific, Eastern District of Texas. Do you want to be in the Eastern District of Texas, or do you want to be in your local jurisdiction under a declaratory relief action? That's one of the first questions you need to answer. And if you're in Texas, you know who to hire. Let's talk briefly about the costs of patent litigation because they're not uh, insubstantial. This is a survey from um, the Bar Association for IP Lawyers called the AIPLA. It's dated 2011. And I've talked with a number of you about alternative fees, uh, in particular capped or fixed fees, and the uh, predictability or the unpredictability in this particular kind of litigation um, and the possibility for uh, setting fees on a predictable basis. I think it can be done. The primary factors are, of course, the jurisdiction that we just identified. But they're also the size of, of the case. What's at issue in the case? If you have a smaller product that's accused in a patent infringement case, it doesn't make any sense for you to hire a lawyer and spend $2 million defending it. You need to work with your outside counsel to establish a fee arrangement that makes sense and that uh, has some bearing on the scope of the business it, that is at issue. Generally, um, in this survey at the AIPLA, which surveyed a ton of uh, law firms that do IP work of all shapes and sizes, uh, it was determined that the smaller cases get tried for less money, which uh, makes sense in it and is as it should be, and the larger ones take more money. The uh, most significant uh, portion of your fees will be spent on discovery. Over 50% of your fees will be spent during the discovery period. It's going to be critical for you to work closely with your outside counsel to make sure that that discovery is done in a way that makes sense from a business perspective and doesn't turn your business upside down. The average time to trial, uh, aka the jurisdiction you're in, will be the other major driver for how much money you're going to spend on a patent case. Uh, this is from the PricewaterhouseCoopers study in 2011 again, and it shows that the Eastern District of Virginia remains one of the fastest dockets to take a case to trial, and the Massachusetts District Court will take you a good over three years before you get to trial. Here I would encourage all of you to talk closely with your counsel about experiences with the particular trial judge that you're assigned to. Just because you file a case in Madison, Wisconsin, does not mean you're going to get to trial in a year. Especially with changes in the bench, if a particular defense lawyer from a particular defense firm becomes a judge in Madison, Wisconsin, you may get a trial a schedule that is not typical to Madison, but is more typical to what a Foley and Lardner partner would try a case in. I'm speaking from personal experience. So look carefully at the jurisdiction. Look carefully at the size of the case that you're dealing with. Work with your business folks to determine the scope of what is at issue, and then tell your lawyers to behave accordingly based on the scope of what is at issue so you don't try a small case for a mammoth budget. Thank you very much.